Agents Podcast. Lab Coat Agents, welcome back to another episode of the Lab Coat Agents Podcast. And uh, we are, I am very excited today to be bringing you a guest who is going to bring some insane knowledge about carrots. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's nothing to do with carrots except for the fact that he owns a company called Carrot. We're not talking about the little orange thing that grows out of the ground. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. I've got Trevor Mock with me today who owns a company called Carrot uh, that, uh, Trevor, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you guys really specialize in helping entrepreneurs, especially real estate uh, professionals, generate leads. And I know maybe that's not necessarily what we're going to talk about today, but a couple of stats that I read when I was stalking you was that uh, in the past five years, you guys have generated over 1.2 million online leads. And just in the last month alone, 72,000 plus. And if mm -hmm. that's not enough to grab someone's attention, uh, you know what, then we're just going to have a conversation, my friend. Um, <laughs> so Trevor, well, wel welcome to the show. Why don't you tell uh, our audience a little bit about yourself, how you came up in business, what Carrot is, and then let's dive into some of the topics uh, that you uh, are passionate about. Jeff, dude, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you big time inviting me on here and big fan of what you guys are doing. Uh, I know you guys have a, a, a huge Facebook community and so, so many of the, of the real estate agents that I respect, you know, Noel uh, and so many other people keep on talking about lab code agents and amazing work you guys are doing. So Thank you. honored to be on here with you, man. Thank you. Um, the, the, the quick of it, uh, kind of who we are, who, who I am, I own a company called carrot, carrot.com. Uh, dude, so this has nothing to do with our business, but it's kind of like one of those little fun wins. We finally got to number two in Google for the word carrot. Like, like it's literally Wikipedia and then us, which means nothing to the business other than it's kind of cool. But um, yeah, so we're on a, a company called carrot.com based here out of Southern Oregon. And as of the time that I'm recording this right now, you know, there's the tons of wildfires going on, which is kind of wild. But um, uh, we, we serve about 8,000 real estate investors and, and agents. Uh, we started in the investor space in a big way, you know, main, mainly helping people who directly buy houses, buy lots, buy land, stuff like that. And in the last couple of years, we've branched into working with a ton of real estate agents because so many of our investor clients were also agents. And they were saying, how can I use, you know, Carrot, that's working so great over here to get motivated house sellers and buyers and, and land sellers. How can I use Carrot for the same thing on the retail side? So. Uh, that's what we did there. We can talk about that stuff later if we, want, if we got to that. But um, our, our main thing, man, is it's really passionate about helping real estate uh, professionals get more consistency and predictability in their lead flow. Um, because like I found in my own entrepreneurial journey, when, when, when I had marketing that trapped me, when I had marketing that would keep me on the hamster wheel all the time, it was really hard to get freedom. It was like really hard to get freedom and create the impact in my business. And that's where so many real estate professionals are, right? We're jamming away on closing deals, jamming away and getting tons of leads, looking at lead volume as the cool thing. Hey, I got so many leads and I got leads at this low cost, but what they don't look at is how is that lead, how is that marketing actually driving your lifestyle and is it driving it in the right way or is your business because of the way that we're marketing actually leading you away from that picture of freedom, flexibility and impact that you're hoping to have. So uh, that's what I'm passionate about, man. But that's, that's, the, that's the small of it and uh, man, I'm pumped to dive in. It was, so I want to go back to the whole hamster wheel thing that you mentioned. But before we do that, you know, where did you get started? You know, I've read that, uh, you know, you kind of started this journey back in college, which was probably like two years ago because you look super young. So, um, but, but <laughs> to kind of tell us how you, what led you to this point? Like what, what was it, what was the turning point or what was it that you were doing that said, gosh, I, you know, this is a need, this is mm -hmm. the world needs this. Dude, so if, if, if people are watching the YouTube version of this, my hairline will, will say differently that I look young. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 38 right now. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I bought my first rental property. Actually, that's how I got started in real estate. Um, my parents were entrepreneurs out of necessity at a young age. Uh, my dad lost his job when I was probably in third grade or so. And, and, um, and, and my mom actually created a, a business out of our, our basement. And so... From that, the, the first thing is I recognize that you could do it. Like you don't have to go get a job. You can go create your own job. And that's what they had done. They created, they created jobs for themselves that they could kind of control stuff. But also, man, what, what, I, what I saw way early on was I saw that you could do it, but I also saw that I didn't want to do it. And, and here's the reason why. For them, uh, it meant working nights, working a lot of weekends because they dealt with people in construction doing big projects where sometimes they needed stuff delivered at you know, that broke down late at night or on a weekend. 
Um, my mom's business was in the wedding and party business. Weddings and parties happen on the weekends. So we deliver stuff on the weekends. And, and I, I, saw, I saw that, how hard my mom and dad were working so many hours. And I'm like, if that's what business is, I don't want that. And so <clears throat> I started going down another path of thought I wanted to be like a doctor. Um, that, that kind of dream fizzled away in high school once I actually got into an ER during a health occupations rotation and realized I was not going to be a medical professional, almost fainted. Um, and then I went to college not knowing what I was wanting to do. And I had this professor named Ari DeGroot and just this really charismatic guy. And it's for the, the law, um, business law class. And business law should be like the most boring class in the whole university. And I showed up there and it was one of the best classes that I had. He, he was charismatic. He was teaching us business law, but he was doing it through real estate. He was like showing us how he was closing real estate deals. And he was showing us the situations these sellers were in and how he would structure it. And I'm like, if, 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 if real estate and law will give me the passion that he's got, like, that's what I want to do. And so I, I got half of it, right? I flunked the LSATs. I didn't make it in any law school, but I bought my first rental property, four unit property there in Roseburg or at Klamath Falls, Oregon, where I went to college and grew up. And from there, real estate's always been a part of my, my game from the, the passive income side of things. Um, for me, I, I learned early on that I didn't want to do real estate as an active income. Uh, I love marketing. I absolutely am passionate about entrepreneurship and starting companies and, and now technology. Uh, but for me, I'm like, real estate is such an amazing spot to put uh, capital and to put your funds for wealth creation over the long term. And uh, I'll fast forward, man, but that, that all led into me buying more rental properties and then really learning how to use the internet back in 2008 or so, uh, blogging on, on what I was doing around my rental properties, learn how to attract a lot of people through content, people landing on my sites. So I'm like, dude, all these people are landing my websites. How do I turn them into leads? So I got really, really good at, uh, at, at um, conversion rate optimization on my website. I'm like, man, I've got all these people on my websites now converting. What do I do with these leads? And then we turned them into businesses. And ever since then, man, I've been working with, investors, agents, um, as you saw, generating a, a lot of leads. So when you say turning them into businesses, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so 2008, uh, that little blog that I started that still exists, I haven't put a piece of content on it in probably seven years, but it still gets traffic, so it gets about 10,000 visitors a month organically, uh, which is what we you know, teach our agents and investors to do. But um, I was just sitting down and blogging about like, how do I do the move in, move out process for a rental property? And I put on my move in, move out template. And I would blog about this other thing, blog about this other thing. How do you find tenants? How do you screen tenants? Where, where are good rental property um, locations in Oregon? Stuff like that. And I started to get traffic coming to it. And the first real business I created out of it was a publishing company. And we said, okay, we're, we're kind of like this little mini, mini, mini publishing company where we found a way to create content online put it up online so it's up there forever. So like, like I had mentioned, I haven't touched that blog in seven years and still bringing in over 10,000 visitors a month. Dude, I haven't touched it in seven years. Income still comes in from that site from seven to eight, nine, ten 10 years ago. And so the first thing was we go, well, how, how can we create more information and more content that um, other people will need and charge a fair rate for it? So we started to charge for um, advertising on there in, in the publishing side of it. We started to create courses. Uh, we would partner with investors that were in the market doing really, really cool, cool stuff and create digital courses with them. Um, and I exited from that company, not out of a big financial exit. I exited because I, I got burnt out and I essentially sold my half of that company to, to my former business partner and said, man, I'm burnt out on this work. Um, and I moved to a different path, which eventually became Carrot. Interesting. That's, that's pretty cool. So when, when like going back to the publishing piece, what were you guys doing? When I think of publishing, I think of books. So what were you doing with mm -hmm. the publishing? Yeah, dude. So uh, there was a course that came out of it that was about private money. And so we went out there to find some of the investors who were doing the best at raising private capital in those early days when right after the downturn, dude, it was really hard to raise private capital or it was really hard to raise capital from banks, 2008, 9, 10. And so if you wanted to continue doing deals in 8, 9, and 10, you Need to, you needed to find a way to raise capital from outside of bank, the banking institutions. And so we went out there and said, okay, what investors do we know in these communities that are doing really well with that? And we put together home study courses. We put together digital trainings, things like that. Um, and, and it's a lot more popular now. Back then, it was kind of the very, very early stages of, of really creating digital trainings and digital courses. 
And um, some of them actually, like I'm looking at some of the physical printed binders and stuff I still have here for nostalgia, but, but we would do that. And uh, we kind of ran, ran that through what, 2011 for a few years. And then that's kind of the time that for me, I just got burnt out, not, 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 not in the business. We had great products. We had great customers. Uh, my small team was awesome. Um, I, I got burnt out, man, because I wasn't doing the work that gave me energy. You know, it, it was, it, it was something I heard from a friend of mine and he said, man, once you find your unique ability, like once you find your unique ability, go all in on unique ability. And you've heard it from guys like Gary Vee or other people where they say, you know, just like, uh, just go all in on your strengths and just ignore your weaknesses. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. There's some nuances to it that I think people should, should pay attention to, but that, that was the reason that I decided, well, I need to do something different because 80% of the work that I'm doing, it makes us a lot of money, but it drains my energy, man. And this is not why I created a business. I created a business to, to be a fuel for my passion. I created a business to give me more energy, not to drain it. Um, if we're going to spend 30, 40, 50, 60 hours a week on a company, we should have the vast majority of our time in that company giving us energy, giving us life, not sucking the life out of us. And so that's when I kind of decided to go through about an 18 month transformation mindset wise and completely rethinking the way I do business, which led into how we do care and, and how we help our clients, but completely tr transform the way, the way I started thinking about business and life in general. And I'm like, can I build a business that actually fuels me? Can I build a business that gives me energy? Can I give a business, build a business where rather than 80% of my work sucking the energy out of me, but makes me good money. How do I make it to where 80% of my work gives me energy? And, um, dude, uh, that's, that, that's, that's how we grew carrot to, to where it is today. That's awesome, dude. That's really, really cool. Um, and you know, for the sake of our audience, which is, is just predominantly real estate agents, right? Mm -hmm. yep. You know, when, when you talk about getting into business and building a business for freedom and, and, and your business, your job fueling you, I mean, that's, let's be honest. I don't know what the statistics are, but it's gotta be very, very low. I mean, I think the average human, let's just say the average American goes to work out of necessity, not because of passion, not yep. because it's not because it drives them, right? It, it actually, it, it drains them and they go home and they find mm -hmm. their passions through hobbies. So what would be the best advice that you would give to a real estate agent who says, you know, I got into real estate because I, of, of flexibility. I, I can work when mm -hmm. I need to work. Um, and yeah, it, it, it creates an opportunity to make a crap ton of money, but at the same token, it's really freaking hard. And when a deal goes sideways, it wears me out. And, you know, so what's, what's advice that you give to real estate agents that says, you know, make your career create your energy. Yep. Dude. So here's, here's, here's the first thing, man. Um, I think the first thing that I learned this, let's go back to like 2012 here. Okay. The first thing that I learned that really helped it to be a big shift for me was I, dude, I had so many limiting beliefs that were, that were shaping the way that I was building my business because that's how everybody else was doing it. Right? Like people were glorifying the grind. People were glorifying doing these things crazy early in the morning, working 60 hours a week as, as if this is an amazing thing to do forever. Now the grind can be great for a short period of time, but you know, the grind, if, if you look at gears and think about the physical act of grinding, eventually those gears will get ground to a pulp. The thing will seize and it won't work anymore. And so that was, the first thing I said, well, this is the model that I've been chasing because there's these limiting beliefs and it was created limiting beliefs around, um, around my business. Uh, what if I chased a different model? Like, are there people that out, are out there that are doing the type of business that I would love to build that are not grinding? Are there, are there people out there that are built, that have built a business that truly seems like they're doing their most interesting work that they can work when they want to, that they have true freedom. Okay. I'll, I'll talk with a lot of real estate agents and investors who say, oh, I'm doing this for the freedom. And I say, cool, can you take a month off and not check into work at all? And like the answer almost is always no. I go, cool. Well, the definition of freedom is being able to make the choice at any given time to do what you want to do. And if you have a business that you cannot take a month off of work, and I'll tell you why a month is important. But if you have a business that you cannot take a month off of work without checking into your work and without them checking into you and it grows while you're gone, then you don't have a business. You have a job that, that you are a slave to that job. Okay, we might take a week off, we might take two weeks off, and that's great, but that's not true freedom. Okay, that's, that's just a longer chain from that business is all. And so um, I, I started this in 2016, and, and I'll give people a very, very specific exercise they can do right now that goes back to unique ability and goes back to energy, because that was the thing that changed it for me. But um, I, I'm, I'm off the heels of a, of a month vacation, and the first time that I took 
the month off, the full month off was in probably 2015, 2016. And that's when I kind of had that epiphany. Uh, and that was after I started Carrot. I said, you know what? Um, I, I, I never want to look at this business as something that I'm tied to. Like it should always be something that fuels my passion and fuels the impact we're wanting to make. If it's ever something that is, is sucking the fuel out of me, then I need to change it. And so one of the things that, that I did before starting Carrot, after that transition from my other company, is I sat down and I said, okay, what are the things I don't like about my, my, any business I've ever ran before? Like, let me write down the things I don't like about it. And so I started to write it down. I'm like, okay, I don't like that I didn't have, have, have freedom and flexibility. I didn't like that my income wasn't consistent. At the end of the year, it was good, right? But on a month to month basis, it would kind of be like this, which creates a lot of stress. If you can't, if you can't predict your income within a 10% variance, let's say three, four, five, six months out, uh, that's kind of stressful a little bit. You can't really plan hires very well. You can't plan a month vacation as well. Things like that. Um, I wasn't having a lot of fun consistently. I wasn't building an asset. And this is something that's very specific for agents as well is when you're just churning transactions, making good active income, that's great. But what happens, what happens if something happens to you or you just get burnt out on the work? All that work that you put in the last five years, three years, 10 years, 20 years, that didn't build value as an asset unless you took that money and put it into an asset, real estates or business that build value, or you built a brokerage that is an asset, right? So I took those things I didn't like, I wrote them down and I said, well, oftentimes the thing, the way that we wanna find the things that we do like and that we do wanna go after is the opposite of the stuff that is the most painful. And so I said, well, what's the opposite of those five things? And the opposite was, well, I wanna build, build businesses that are fun. I wanna build a business that's consistent and predictable, where I can predict the income within 10% variance in six months. Um, that's going to release a lot, a lot of stress. I want to build a business that's like actually building an asset rather than just me churning transactions. Um, I want to build a business where I'm working within my unique abilities, right? Um, and then the fifth one is I'm spacing out on me right now. But those are those were four of the five non-negotiables. As soon as I wrote those non-negotiables down, dude, then it was game on. Because then I had the vision to go, okay, this is the type of business I want. Now let me go find examples of people living businesses like this. Let me get close and let me learn what they're doing. And, um, and that's what I did. And I'm not going to say it's not hard work, but I think that's one of the biggest things that real estate agents specifically don't do is they look at all the other agents out there and that's their, their example of them hustling, grinding, working six, seven days a week, doing showings on weekends, on vacations, on phone calls with their friends and family when that's not the dream that most of them wanted. We glorify it, but that's not the dream. The dream is I work when I want to. I have true flexibility. I could take a month off if I want to. I have leads coming in consistently and predictably that I don't have to be on the hamster wheel to get. And this business fuels me rather than me fueling it. I love it, dude. I love it. And so it's, it's interesting. One thing I want to point out there that you mentioned, which is glorifying the grind. I swear that has yep. become more taboo and I see it like, you know, obviously a group like lab code agents, there's other real estate groups that are out there and, and there's a lot of posts occasionally you see them, like they kind of come in waves mm -hmm. of, you know, what does your daily schedule look like? And, and everybody who's passionate about responding or commenting on that topic is that person who has that 5 a.m. club mentality. Like you have to get yeah. up at 5 a.m. And this is, you meditate and then you read and then you, it's just this big, to me, I, I watch it, um, but I don't have that mentality. And I'm a successful guy, but I, I don't know that I'm at your status in terms of the control piece, but um, I can get up at 7.30 one day if I want and I can get up at 5 one day if I want. Uh, it doesn't necessarily yep. have an impact on my energy. It doesn't have an impact on my, um, you know, how much I get done that day, those kind of things. Right. And yep. I don't know about you, but I feel like that is just way over taken way too far. And people feel like, well, if I do this, like, like, you know, this successful, like Gary Vee does, then I will get to Gary Vee's status. I will have mm -hmm. that success. And I think that's a bunch of nonsense, yep. but, uh, since you brought it up, what, what is your, what are your thoughts on that? Dude, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of merit in it, right? Like, especially in the early days, especially in the early when you're trying to start something, I mean, you got to work your butt off. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to people on, on this call and say, hey, you know what? Uh, don't work as hard and just, just kind of like be, be lax about it. You got to work your butt off in the early days because that's where most people 
uh, you know, don't see success is they put in 30 days of work, 60 days of work, six months of work, a year's worth of work. They did a lot of the right stuff and they maybe didn't see things pop. And then they see this other opportunity over here and they go check that out. And so in those early days, y'all, you do have to grind. You've got to hustle. You've got to, you've got to really make it work. But I think the big thing is, uh, is we need to have a vision for what's after the grind and when the switch is going to happen. Because like I said, we can't be in that perpetual grind forever. And that's where people are, I think, mindset wise, they're in that. Like they don't have a vision for what happens. Like, what am I building towards? What am I grinding for? What, what is the vision of what this business should do? And how am I making sure that my grind is actually creating that, not just grinding for grinding sake. And so what, what I started to do in those early days, dude, like even when I was in the grind, I, I, I made the five non-negotiables. Like what is my business going to look like? And if, if it ever doesn't look like this, I'm going to change it or I'm going to get rid of the business. I'm going to walk away from it. I'm going to sell it, like whatever it is. So that's the first thing is people have to have the vision for what they want to create. And for me, publishing those five non-negotiables was it. And I still have those and I still operate by them today. Like every single year I go into my, my annual planning, I look at those five non-negotiables I created, shoot, you know, seven or eight, uh, seven or eight years ago. And I say, does Carrot or do any of my companies still match these five? And if not, uh, which one or ones is it not quite matching? And then that's some of the first stuff I look at this next year. I go, cool, I need to get this changed over here. Otherwise, I'm going to get rid of the business or uh, go do something else if the business ever grows into something that is not that. And then the second thing is, is managing your energy. Because um, I think like, like Gary Vee, dude, one of the things that impresses me so much about him is he's created a structure around him. This is what a lot of people don't realize, right? Gary Vee grinds the heck out of it, but he's got a team of 700 people, okay? He, he's got a Gary Vee team of the last time I checked of like 20 or 25 just on his content. So if you guys see him posting like 40 posts on Instagram a day, it's not Gary posting most of that stuff. It's a team doing it. It's processes that he created. Okay, he documented what worked. So he hustled to create the processes. He hustled, he hustled to figure out what worked. He documented it because he, he was smart and said, I don't want to do this forever. And it's better and more scalable if other people do it. And I'd rather just do what gives me energy. And then he plugged people into that. And then he spends his time mostly doing what gives him energy, which is going out there and talking to people, unscripted, unscripted presentations. He just goes, because that gives him energy. For him, it sucks the energy out of him to create a PowerPoint slide like, like me. Okay, it gives him energy to go talk to people in real life and just give them advice. All that stuff gives him energy. It gives him energy to think up strategy. That's the stuff that he's doing 99% of. And then he has processes and people doing the rest. But he, but he had to build those processes and people to do that. And so I think that's the big mindset shift a lot of people have to make is, is I've got a process called the energy audit that I use. And people can go get it, download it for free, um, you know, no opt-in or anything like that. Just go to carrot.com forward slash Trevor, uh, carrot.com forward slash Trevor, and you'll find all of my productivity resources there, including this energy audit. Um, I'm so passionate about what it did for me. I wouldn't just go get it and use it. Like I said, there's no opt-in or nothing. Just go get it. Um, and so what, what the energy audit is, is, is this, is once you've got your five non-negotiables and you're clear about what you're building and you have examples of people that have done that to remove those limiting beliefs, because you, you need to stop looking at all the agents who are grinding away forever as, as glorifying them and glorify you know, another model. Next thing is you need to find what gives you energy and put more time into that and remove the stuff that takes your energy away. So the energy audit is essentially lying down the middle of the paper. Uh, like so you guys can go get the worksheet and there's uh, instructions on there, carrot.com forward slash Trevor. But um, lying down the middle of the paper, on one side of it, it gives energy. And the other side of it, it drains energy. And in 2012, I wrote that down after I got back from a, um, a coaching program that was trying to help me kind of find my unique abilities, right? And the gal said this, it's one thing that finally hit. She said, you'll know when you found your unique abilities when those things give you more energy when you're done doing them than when you started doing them. And you could be world-class at them if you really invested the time. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I said, well, let me write that stuff down. Line down the middle, gives drains, okay? Write down all the stuff that you're currently doing in an average week that drains your energy. I'm talking stuff in business business, outside of business, life thing, right? In, in, in anything at all. Uh, what, what drains your energy that you're currently doing on an average week? On the other side, what gives you energy, including stuff you're not doing, like especially stuff that gives you energy that you're just not carving up the time to do. Okay. So now you've got these lists. And then I worked that way for probably three or four quarters. I'm like, there's something missing. So the next thing was, uh, if it's not great, if it's not, um, 
you know, if there's no metrics, how, how do you move it? You can't move it without metrics. I said, well, let me just give it like a ratio of what percentage um, of time I'm spending in energy draining versus energy giving activities. And it was 80% energy draining at that time, 20% energy giving. It's like, no wonder I wasn't enjoying my work, right? And then I said, okay, cool. Now I've got to put action to it. So I did a, di- I, I, I did a brain dump. I did a diagnosis. So I have my percentage. Now I need a plan. And I circled the, the one to two things that were draining my energy the most. And right, how many hours per week um, were, was I putting into those two activities? And one was seven hours and let's say one was three. So 10 hours total a week I was putting into these two things that made me good money usually. Like they're the hardest things to give away because you're like, how do I give those away? Those are the things that actually make money for me. For an agent, how do I give showings away? That's actually what makes money for me. How do I give away cold calling because that's how I get my business? Or how do I give away whatever? But if they don't give you energy, you need to find someone to plug in there that does that, that gives them energy. So those two things, 10 hours total, I bring them over to the side. And I'm like, all right, this quarter, and I do the energy out of every quarter. This quarter, that, those are the first two things I'm going to do. I'm going to pull back and document how I do that thing, especially if it makes us money. If it doesn't make us money, like stop doing it if you can. But if it makes you money, it's part of your business driving forward, document how you're doing it, write it down, put it into a loom video, whatever it is. And now go find a person to plug into it. And then you take that 10 hours and go, cool. What thing over here in the energy give do I want to add that 10 hours to each week? Even if it doesn't make you money, like literally, even if it, for, so for podcasting for me, writing articles what, was what made us money for, with Carrot in the early days and it still does. Like writing content that ranked well in Google that attracted people to us. The same thing we teach our, our clients. Um, I wrote most of our content. It drained the energy out of me, dude. I'd say up until one, two, three o'clock in the morning writing these articles sometimes. Sometimes putting six to seven hours into like a three or 4,000 word article that ranked really well and brought us people. And I did the energy audit and like two or three energy audit in, in, audit, audits in a row. I would see that on there like writing articles on the energy drain. I'm like, I can't give it up. That's what makes our, that's, that's our driver. And then one day um, after taking a trip with my family, uh, we live about three hours away from, our fam- from my family. Um, is after one of those grind sessions you know, at night until it's trying to pump out an article so my team can put it up online. Me justifying in my mind, I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this. It's not, I, I can put up with the lack of sleep. I'm doing it for them. And if, as long as I can put up with it, it's not harming them. We're good. And so we get up, we go on a trip. I'm driving. The three kids are in the back. Um, my wife's in the passenger seat, uh, reading a book and it's up in the mountains, you know, windy mountains in Oregon. And one second I'm awake, felt okay. Next second, asleep. And just like in the movies, I, I woke up just in time. There's, we're up in the mountains in, in, the, in, the, in the curves and there's a guardrail here and probably 40 yards up, guardrail stopped, 40 yards back, guardrail stopped. And I woke up just in time to have the front bumper scrape the guardrail, stop dead cold in the middle of the highway. I get out, my wife's like, what just happened? I said, babe, I fell asleep with my kids in the back and you hear ravine on the other side of it. And there's a point to this story is I I didn't drive uh, our family car for a trip for six months. No more because I didn't trust myself. And also, and also my business had been built in a way that it was doing things that required me to grind and sucking the energy out of me. And I went home and I said, I'm going to not work nights or weekends anymore. I don't care if I see 8,000 posts about a software company owners having to grind for 70 hours a week to make this work. I'm going to make it work in under 40. I'm not going to bring my computer in the house at night. I'm not going to bring it in a weekend and I'm not going to work at night or weekend anymore. And how do I build a business now that will do that? And cause I don't want to jeopardize my family. And so I took out the energy out. It looked at that thing that was causing me to be up until two and three, three in the morning. Often I'm like, I need to find a great writer that can write for me. Uh, what part of that gives me energy? I love the strategy. I love up the strategy there because I just don't want to write it. So I found the dude to do it. I paid him good money to write it. And I said, I'm going to start a podcast. That gives me so much energy, but I don't know how to make money with it. And I don't care. I just want to do it because it gives me energy. And so if you guys start to make those trades often, I can guarantee you it's not going to all happen at once. It might happen over a year. It might happen over two years. But the more that you trade off energy draining for energy giving things, and the more that you, you buckle down the right process, then hand process up to, off to good people, your income's actually going to go up insanely. It's not going to go up incrementally. It's going to go up insane because now you're putting your time into your unique abilities that are, it's actually going to penetrate you in the market even more. It's actually going to bring you up in front of more people and you're going to have so much energy in your business that now you can put that behind impact and purpose instead of just going up to another showing. 
So guys, use the energy audit, uh, chase energy, write your five non-negotiables. Um, those alone uh, can completely change your business. Wow. I mean, that's a, uh, that's a fascinating story, dude. And that's, that's, uh, I think really good content. I mean, uh, you know, you and I talked on off offline before we started go live. And I, I, I always tell all my guests, I'm like, I don't necessarily have a plan here unless you do. Let's just chat. Um, I didn't see it going down this, this path, but this is really cool because I think this is so applicable cool. to, to real estate agents, you know, to, to they're, they're entrepreneurs, right? So, yep. um, you know, I mentioned the hamster wheel piece earlier. And so you just gave them some, some wicked nuggets on, you know, how they can audit their energy and how they can scale their business. So I have, I have a couple of questions. One, I want to go back to the hamster wheel because you mentioned that about treating evergreen marketing. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, and what, 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 I guess, define the hamster wheel that you see most real estate agents are currently on, uh, mm -hmm. kind of that wake up moment. Uh, and then yep. actually, let's go there. Let's go there first and let's see where that takes us. Cool. I, I, I love it, man. So at, at the very base level, so it's kind of picture literally a hamster wheel sitting over here and then picture like a stack of bricks over here. Okay. And so the hamster wheel is any type of marketing or any activity too. Like it, it doesn't have to be just marketing, right? But any activity that where you step on that hamster wheel, you start doing the thing. So I'll give you some examples, cold calling, direct mail, um, going and doing uh, open houses, anything at all that when you step on it, it works. Like and posting on Facebook and Instagram works if you do it the right way, right? Um, doing direct mail works, picking up the phone, cold calling, they all work. Like we say people should do those things, um, but, but recognize that if your business is built off of that, uh, you're walking on the hamster wheel, as soon as you step off of it, what happens is the hamster wheel slows to a stop. And, and the only way to get it going is you gotta get back on the hamster wheel, you gotta keep walking, and then you get off of it, slows to a stop. And so, so many of our businesses are built off of the hamster wheel marketing. Like it's not that, oh, I do some, but it's built off of evergreen, which I'll talk about evergreen here in a second. It's almost it's all built off of hamster wheel marketing for most entrepreneurs and most real estate uh, agents and investors uh, included. Um, you're doing your posts on Facebook, you're doing your posts on Instagram, they all work once again. But what happens, especially on those things is 72 hours later, no one's going to see that thing. So you got to post three or four or five times today. You got to post three or four or five times tomorrow. You're on vacation. You can't have like a gap and stuff. So four or five times on vacation and you're, you're just never able to pull away. So now let's look at this, this, this stack of bricks over here. Okay. The bricks are going to wreck or they're going to um, uh, signify evergreen marketing. Okay. I've got the hamster wheel, which I know when I hop on it, dude, it's going to work. It's going to work immediately, but I also know that I'm going to get tired eventually and I've got to jump off it or I've got to get someone to get, to, to, to get on it for me, right? Processing people. So let's stack a brick and that brick signifies content online. It signifies things that are going to be around for a while. You know, you're going to stack the brick, slap some mortar on it, stack the brick, slap some mortar on it. Each one of those is a page on your website or a piece of marketing that, that's evergreen. That's going to be working for you today as well as it's working for you in six years. Okay. Going all the way back to my earlier story with that first website I put up, dude, I still get traffic every single day today from work I did eight years ago, and I still get money from that. So now how do we as a real estate agent uh, do that? How do, how do we create marketing that works for us three, four, five, six years down the later and amplify it with, ever, with uh, hamster wheel so we're not building it off of hamster wheel? So you keep stacking those bricks, and we can talk about content here, but it could be a location page, kind of like Zillow built over the years, right? Where they've, they've niched them in. It could be authority content that you put not just on Facebook or Instagram, but you put it on your website or what we call an authority hub. Okay, you take that content and you put it on an authority hub where it lives on forever and you can, you can start to attract people through Google searches for the niches that you're the, you're the local expert in. And you keep stacking these. Eventually, you're gonna have a whole row of, of bricks, Jeff, right? And people, what, this is what happens with people. They go, man, I put, I, put, I put a lot of work into that. It was hard, my hands got dirty. Um, man, but it's only like a row of bricks and it's not a wall yet. It's not doing anything for me. You know what? This, this hamster wheel stuff is way easier. Let me just get back on over there because it's got immediate feedback and it works immediately. That's where most people give up. They did some work. They put some content online on their website. They might have done a few YouTube videos and they said after three months, ah, I'm not really getting the results, so I'm going to go back to this. But imagine you instead go, okay, I envision a wall and I know it's going to take some time to build, stack more bricks and make this wall. And I'm going to keep stacking and keep stacking. I'm going to hop over here, get on the hamster and we'll get some business coming in real quick. Okay. Okay, cool. I'm going to go back over here, stack content, stack content on my website, stack on the website, some hamster wheel. Eventually, Jeff, you've got a wall. That wall bounces everything back for you. It does the work for you. 
uh, okay, it, it's going to attract the clients, your best clients for you. It's going to be around for years. It's not going to go away tomorrow. It's not going to go away next week or next month or six months from now. Um, and now the cool thing is the hamster wheel can be there when you need it. Okay, it can be a part of the business, but your business is not built off of it now. So a, 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 quick, a quick story illustrating that. Um, I've got a client, Tyler Ford. He's an agent and an investor down in Tucson. And, um, and he, he, he will buy houses and flip them, but he's also an EXP agent with a really good big downline down there in Tucson. Uh, downline. Probably shouldn't have said that. Is that what they call that in EXP? Yeah, it is. But, well, uh, I call uh, it that, so I understood what you meant. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to call it that too. Um, so, so anyway, for him, he was doing a lot of outbound marketing before, you know, which is hamster wheel. It's you know, direct, uh, direct marketing, direct mail, cold calling. This stuff works once again, y'all. I don't say not to do it. I say just recognize if your business is built off of it, that when you stop doing it, your business will go down and you, have, you, have, you, you don't have consistency and predictability. When you don't have consistency and predictability, you don't have freedom and impact in your business, okay? And so what we're after over here is freedom and impact. We need to get it through consistency and predictability. We need to do marketing that gets us that. And that's what we're trying to build here. And so uh, he started to go the online route. And now if you're to Google any phrase like sell my house fast Tucson or any phrase like that, or any phrase, lots of phrases for buyers too, you're going to find one of his three websites up there. He has three. I suggest people just do one, but he's just, he's just going crazy with it. And he closes somewhere between three and eight deals a month, uh, just off of organic stuff. And he was getting ready to give up, give up the business completely about two years ago. He's like, I'm getting wore out. He had a big flip that went bad. A contractor took 25 grand and ran. Um, that was kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back. He was seeing big competitors, both on the agent side and the investor side, come in, outspend him with marketing, more outbound marketing than he was. He saw his business shrink down. And he's like, man, I don't like this, but I do see this vision of having people come to me. And when they come to you, they're oftentimes the highest margin. They're usually the most motivated. They're usually the easiest to work with. Okay. And so he started stacking content on his website in a very specific way. And now he doesn't do any other marketing. So we're seeing three and eight deals a month all come from inbound, all come from evergreen marketing. And a lot of the deals he gets today is from content he put up two years ago, three years ago you know, whatever it is. So that, that's the vision y'all. And the reason I wanted to tell those two analogies is because evergreen marketing does take work. Okay. Creating content that builds authority does take work. You don't have to be a writer to do it. Um, we can show you some ways that you can do it without writing almost anything. Uh, you don't have to be great on camera to do it, but if you are, it's something that can make it even easier. Um, but guys, that's the path for us to freedom and, and, and impact and then use hamster wheel to amplify everything else. That's interesting, man. I love it. I love it. That's a great analogy. And so, uh, when, as it pertains to a realtor, I'm going to put you on the spot here and let's just say I'm a real estate agent and I'm saying, man, I love everything that you're saying. It completely makes sense, but I'm struggling with the content idea. What is an example yep. or two of an evergreen piece of content that I, as a residential real estate agent, can put out there mm. that may attract business years from now? Dude, uh, awesome. So one, one piece of content that I see people putting out, which you should be putting this out, but this is the main piece of content I see agents putting out is the content about a specific property, right? That's amazing. Like put it out as a part of your marketing package for that property, but just recognize it's not going to do a lot for you in six months or six years. Uh, but but no, nowhere in your marketing package it goes. And so when, when I'll talk to agents, a lot of them are going like, I'm already creating a bunch of content and we, when we dig into it. Oftentimes it's, it's property videos and stuff, which once again, do that because it works, but that's not usually evergreen. Okay. Right. Uh, so the type of content that we suggest uh, people do is this. And I've got a little thing called the care authority builder. It's just a little PF, PDF and I'll kind of visualize it for you guys. But at the very base of all of your content, uh, the first thing is we, we have to make sure that our content is putting out things that are pushing forward our personal mission and our values in our business. And I know it sounds really weird, Jeff, right? Like people are probably going, well, Trevor, give me tactical stuff, which I'm going to give you some of that really uh, after this. But uh, if, if, you were to, if you were to only put out tactical stuff and you were only put out like XYZ tour of this neighborhood or whatever it is, and I'll show you guys some real examples here in tech, and you don't, and you don't have clarity on why you're doing business. Like this goes all the way back to what I was talking about before I started Carrot. Being clear on your why, being excited at your core. Like, why am I in this business of real estate in the first place? Am I? Are you freaking pumped up about about who you're serving? And I want you to write down who am I serving and why am I serving them. And don't put down the thing that an average agent is going to put. 
the average agent's gonna put, I serve Douglas County residents and I'm serving them to show them the best possible experience and da 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 da. Like if you can put any of any old agent's face on top of your about page or your mission statement, that's not something that's hitting you in the core. Let's say you're a school teacher for 30 years, now you're a real estate agent. You, your, yours might be, you know what? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm here to serve young families. And I found when I was a teacher for 30 years at XYZ School District, that the families that thrived the most are the families that they had the, the, the best home life and they were in the best neighborhoods. And I'm here to serve young families, to find the neighborhoods where their families can thrive. And that is why I do business as a real estate agent, to help young families thrive, to grow great uh, upstanding citizens of Oregon or whatever it is. Like if that's something you're passionate about, right? Mm -hmm. So number one, that's the first thing is be clear in your, your mission and your values because that needs to tie through everything that you do. That's going to attract the right people to you. That's going to, that's going to make it so people resonate with you and the message of any content you do. Next thing I want you guys to do is write down uh, locations. Okay, so Zillow, uh, the way that Zillow started to become dominant was they just created a page for every location, every niche in, like, in the world. And so now when you, when you Google those things, they rank really high, oftentimes number one or number two in Google. And a lot of agents have this limiting belief of, well, I can't beat Zillow, but you can. You can. Uh, here's the way you become a better authority of that specific niche in that, that little area. And here's an example. If you were to Google a phrase like, like, um, you know, sell my house fast, insert any city in the country, you're going to find a lot of carrot sites ranking number one, uh, 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 and or first page in Google. I'm looking up this, um, I'm looking up this phrase really quick here. If you were to Google like farmland Roseburg, you know, Roseburg is where I'm sitting right now. R O S C B U R G. You're going to find the number one ranking in Google is a piece of content over and above all the national sites. If you were to Google like North Umpqua River Homes for sale, it's a high end area uh, out here in Oregon. It's a niche. Zillow would usually be number one in Google for that. Okay, now it's a, it's a client who created a better location page, a better authority page than Zillow did. And they've been ranked number one in Google over Zillow, over, um, over uh, realtor.com for well over a year, almost two years now. Okay, so you cannot rank them. So that's the next thing is I want you guys to write down your locations. What are the cities and or niches within those locations that you want to specialize in? And maybe start with five. Okay, so talking of Roseburg, maybe create a page that is Roseburg, but that's where a lot of agents stop, right? They stop by creating a page for the whole city, but it's going to be really hard for you to outrank Zillow or Realtor.com for the whole city for, sell, for, for XYZ city homes for sale. It's going to be almost impossible. What you can do is outrank them for the niches, which is where the, the real, the best leads are anyway. So within your, your town, you know, do the page page for that overall city. But now what niches? Well, I love this neighborhood. These three neighborhoods I want to crush it in. This niche, the North, the, the North Umpqua River Homes, um, luxury homes for in this city. And then uh, let's say this other niche of new construction in Roseburg, Oregon. Those are niches that I love. I can crush it on. I want to only do that. Create a page on your website for each one of those that, that has great content on it, at least five to 800 words. That's one of the big things. And um, you know, we, we have a format that we can teach people and maybe another call or I can link it up. And then the third type of content is this, Jeff. So the first one is, uh, you know, make sure you're, you're locked in your mission, vision, values. Next thing is write down your, your locations, create location pages on them. It's got to be done in a very certain way and we can link it up to people. Number three is your authority content. And so your location pages are kind of like a once a quarter kind of thing. Okay. Once a quarter, write down what other niche location page do I want to create in my site? Maybe aim at making three to five a quarter, right? And over time, those are going to be online. Like that Roseburg Farmland one, they created that in 2017. It's ranked number one in Google for the phrase Roseburg Farmland. All the dude did was what I'm going to teach next. Okay. All he did was this. He knew that farmland was one of his niches. He had a page on his website that was Roseburg Farmland for sale. And he said, well, I'm going to go out and create like five to eight videos on that niche of me out there in the, in the, in, in the properties talking about these, these niches. So he took out his phone. He had someone record it for him actually. And he said, Hey, hey I'm Denny with blah, 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 blah. And he started talking about farmland. Okay. Make these videos three to eight minutes long. There's a very specific reason. Uh, the average per person speaks 120 to 160 words a minute. Google wants to see a piece of content online, at least 500 words, but ideally closer to the 800 word mark in order for it to be really robust enough to rank well for any halfway competitive phrase. So we're aiming for at least 500, but closer to 800 words of robust content. So in that video, make sure you're mentioning the area, make sure you're talking about, like you're not just saying locally, you're saying in Roseburg, you're saying homes for sale in Roseburg, you're saying if you're looking to buy land in the Roseburg area, things like that, right? 
So he did that, uploaded it to YouTube. And then what we used to do back in the day was we would send that to rev.com. We transcribe it to get the words out of it. And we put the YouTube video at the top. We put the transcription below. We doctor it up to make sure it didn't look like an article or like a transcription. We'd hit publish. Um, as long as you have a website that's set up to rank well in Google, that's what we focus on at Carrot, it would have a decent chance at ranking well. So we started doing that a lot. And what we ended up doing, Jeff, is we created a, a feature called Video Post that automates it all. Like you do the video, upload it to YouTube, click a couple buttons, and then our system yanks the words out of the video. Uh, it does all the transcription for you. It emails you a couple hours later and says, hey, your article is ready. It's got your title. It's got your video. It's got all the words below it. And then if you wanted to, you could edit it up. So that dude in, far in Roseburg Farmland, that's all he did. He did, he did a video post, three minute and 26 second video talking about farmland. He did you know, six, seven or eight of those in a series. And then some of them are going to start to rank really well in Google. And that's been number one in Google for three years. He's earned you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands in commissions on farmland sales from that. Wow. So do those weekly. So I'll wow. recap that. Get your mission vision values done. Tie that through all your videos. Write down your primary city and maybe your top five niches within that city, like your North Umpqua Rivers or whatever. Create a location page for each one of those, at least 500 words with listings from the IDX in there with an opt-in form on every one of those pages that says, interested in a, a daily updated list for this type of property, cool opt-in. And then that, do that quarterly, add new location pages quarterly. You're stacking bricks, right? And then last is do it, the video post weekly, right? Like take out that cell phone, you're out there on the property, you know your niches, record a three to eight minute video on that niche, upload it to YouTube and do one of those weekly and make mm -hmm. sure where, where, people, where people are missing is they're just adding it to Facebook or Instagram, which that's gone in 72 hours. Guys, that's hamster wheel. Take that same content, get it into YouTube, stack it on your authority hub. That's what we call it. And that's up there forever now. And as long as it's optimized the right way, people start finding it in three months and six months and 12 months and six years from now. Whenever. Yeah. Wow. So it sounds to me like, and we're, we're run long on time here that this, it, it does, you said, maybe we could do this another time. I mean, is, is this, so where you just ended the missions, values, locations, the authority content, like the strategy behind ranking, the strategy behind Google SEO, right? All that stuff. Uh, is that something that we, that we could maybe reschedule another one and just go deep dude. on that? Uh, dude, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you every tactic, every strategy in there love for it. sure. Dude, I love that'd it. be fun. I love it, man. This has been fantastic, dude. I mean, this is, and, and so for those of you, maybe that you got on a, a little late, um, this was powerful at the end, but you need to go back and listen to the, to the energy audit and all that good stuff. I mean, carrot.com forward slash Trevor, you go find that energy audit. Uh, just carrot.com and go find some good stuff. Uh, Trevor, as we, as we wrap up, first of all, teasing that look out, we're going to do another one of these and we're going to go super deep cool. just on, uh, just on the, the ranking concept, just on being found more on Google, just on building that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Where can somebody find you? Somebody says, I don't want to wait, Trevor, how can I reach cool. out to you guys now? Dude, yeah, I mean, carrot.com is, is a great spot to learn what we do and how we help agents and investors. And essentially what, what we talked about there, we have a lot of features that just make that easy, you know, make it easier. So what I talked about, you guys can totally do it off of carrot as long as it's styled in the right way. We just make it easier, check it out. Um, or dude, Instagram is probably where I'm the most active. Uh, but if you guys go to, go to carrot.com forward slash Trevor, T-R-E-V-O-R, it's got a link to my, my Instagram there. Um, it's got a link to the podcast and dude, I, I, I love the podcast. Like half of it is literally me driving home with my phone and my truck uh, and just recording whatever's on my mind. Those ones get the best pod, uh, get the best comments. And so it's called the carrot cast. So let's go to carrot.com forward slash Trevor and you can find uh, everything there. Awesome, dude. This has been fantastic. And now I'm excited to uh, do another one. So for those of you that don't know, uh, Trevor and I met at, I think it was a closing table where you came and spoke because yep. you're, you're a part of, uh, the other group, right? Um, what's, what's the other group? What's that one called? Uh, war room. Um, were you war room? No. Or? So I, 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 I am slash was a part of closing table. I just have not been good at coming at the last couple of them. <laughs> well, I mean, shoot, COVID's yeah. kind of put a, put a little, uh, a little wrench in those plans. So, uh, I'm missing that mm -hmm. crew. I actually even wore that shirt today. So. Uh, Trevor, this, it, is, this has been fantastic, man. It's, it's great uh, connecting with you. You brought some massive value and I can't wait to uh, do this again and go super deep uh, because I think this is, ex this is exactly what doesn't get talked about enough in the real estate world anymore. Mm -hmm. And everything's all Zillow this, Zillow that, but 
How about yep. let's just figure out a way to outrank them? And here's how you do it. Yep. And uh, man, you guys have yep. done it. This is awesome. Trevor, thank you so much. And uh, let's, uh, let's connect here real soon again, man. Jeff, I, I appreciate it, man. Thank you guys. Have an amazing rest of the week. Agents Podcast.